it's funny, but I'm not sure which conference it was or, or even what the speaker shared during his presentation. What I remember is the exchange we had before he gave his talk. I was the, one of the first in the room, and he was still setting up. I noticed that his laptop had an orange cover on it. I also noticed that he had switched out the lanyard we had been given with our name tags with his own lanyard, which was also orange. He was wearing an orange shirt. I seem to remember him having an orange watch band. He may have even, if memory serves, had orange shoes. I offered a hello and quipped, <laughs> looks like you like orange. It's my favorite color too. He paused in his preparation for his talk, looked me up and down, noticing that I did have, I'd had no speck of orange on me and said, oh really? I couldn't tell. I have found that attending conferences, workshops, trainings, and the like, it is often these impromptu conversations, these little moments between moments that make the most impact. Again, I don't remember his actual presentation. I don't remember the theme of the conference. But I remember being challenged to consider, was what I said I believed obvious in the way that I lived? I said I love orange, it's my favorite color, but I presented no evidence to back up that claim. In the context of our experience as people of faith, living out our faith in obvious and recognizable ways is sometimes called our testimony or our witness. It's the evidence of our beliefs shared and put on display. Now, while these terms, testimony, witness, evidence, all have a court of law feel to them, the goal is not an empty legalism, not just a going through the motions, but an active and living faith expressed in both word and deed. It's our faith-based show and tell. I wonder, what can people tell about our beliefs by the way we live? It's a question that seems to have been at the heart of some struggle in the early church. In his first letter, Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, writes to exiles scattered across the outskirts of the Roman Empire. He recognizes they are under pressure from those who do not understand who they are or, or what they do, why they do it. And he says in this letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 6, Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. I'm going to pause there for a second. This is the good news. This is the, the, the message of the cross, the empty tomb, right? That Jesus has been raised from the dead. And not only that, but because he has, we too are gifted new life. We have been born into this hope of resurrection. And, and so Peter, writing to this fledgling church, this, this new church, says to them, praise God for this great thing that's happened, this Easter miracle that we get to participate in. And he goes on, this inheritance is kept for you in heaven, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all of this, greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. You get a sense that Peter is writing as a pastor to this early church. He, he's heard that there's been some, some difficulty, some, some controversy perhaps. There's been some struggle with these folks living out their faith. And people are questioning them, giving them a hard time, maybe even we, we could say persecuting them. Peter says, hold on, right? Hang in there. Rejoice, because you've got a hope that's bigger than these sufferings. Jesus has been resurrected. And so the people that Peter writes to, he says, you, you, you believe this. You have, you have been born into this living hope through the resurrection of Christ. So hold on to that truth. Your response when you are faced with suffering, your response when you face these questions should be that hope, right? 
He says, hold on to it. Live out your faith. He adds, if you keep reading this letter, again, in 1 Peter, this is uh, in our New Testament here. So if you keep reading in that letter, I was just reading from the first chapter, but if you re- get to the third chapter, so 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, share this. Again, talking about this, this, these sufferings, these trials, right? Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And do so with gentleness and respect. Friends, I find this to be a timely word. This isn't just something that had been written thousands of years ago to a new church trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. These words are equally applicable to our current context. Think about the divisions and and the ways in which living as a a follower of Christ are are often confusing or, or, or perhaps even looked down upon. They were seen as judgmental and hypocritical, right? Peter Peter says to this early church, and I think he would say to us, hold on to the hope you have in this resurrection life of Jesus, this Easter message we've been proclaiming. Hold on to that hope. And if anyone asks you, why do you do what you do? Give them an answer. Be ready to give them an answer for your hope. But do so with gentleness, with respect. Oh, these are good words. I think Peter's speaking from experience here. I mean, if we journey back to the first Easter, we can see a turning point in his life and in the lives of of those who experienced that resurrection miracle. The the answer that Peter gives, I pray, is the answer that we can give. Let's let's find it. Let's, Let's chase it out here. Remember that first Easter, while it was still dark, the first person to go is Mary Magdalene. While it's still dark, she goes to the tomb. She encounters the risen and living Jesus. She goes and tells others, I have seen the Lord, right? That's what's recorded in in the 20th chapter of John's gospel. I have seen the Lord. That's her answer. That's her witness. That's her testimony. Well, those students who had been following Jesus, these disciples, they're going to have their own encounter with the risen Christ. Now, one of the disciples, one of those students, Thomas, was not there when Jesus first appeared to the rest of them. But when he comes back, they all say, we have seen the Lord. It's, it's a, great, a great exchange about how, how they begin to testify, how they begin to witness to this resurrection miracle. Again, look it up in John chapter 20, both of those stories. I have seen the Lord. This is an affirmation of faith. It's, it's an answer. Why are you the way you are? Why do you do the things you do? Because I've seen Jesus. He's alive. He's real. It's the answer to all of the whys. Mary, why do you serve? Peter, why do you encourage? Exiles living on the fringes of the Roman Empire, right? Why do you share your belongings? Why do you eat with each other? Why do you help strangers? We have seen the Lord. Peter says, that's the, that's the answer you need. That's, that's what it looks like. We have seen the Lord, the living God who gives us new life, who makes all life new. I wonder, friends, have you seen the Lord? And if you have, how can anyone tell? Near the beginning of the the book we call the Acts of the Apostles, right? We've got the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the, uh, the next piece is this continuing story we call the Acts of the Apostles. It's the story of what happens after these disciples, these original followers of Jesus, they see Jesus risen from the dead and they go out 
and begin sharing this good news. Jesus invited them to do that. Jesus told them before he ascends to heaven, he says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go out and share this. You're going to be my witnesses across the whole planet. We can find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And this is where we see the disciples, students of Jesus, become apostles, the ones that are sent out. That's what it means to be an apostle, to be a sent one. It's not the the acts of the disciples, right? It's the acts of the apostles because apostles go, apostles share. It's not just what they believe, but it's what they demonstrate. It's what they share and show to the world. Over time, that, that sending and the sharing that they do solidifies into an affirmation of faith that others pick up and that we now call the apostles' creed, the the way of life, the, the beliefs of these early apostles that become becomes the, the beliefs that we affirm as we are sent out to share this good news. I, I wonder if, if you're, whether you're familiar with these words or not, I wonder if you just recite them with me now. I'm, I'm going to use a traditional version of the Apostles' Creed. It's, it's familiar to to many people in the church because it's been around for so long. But you could easily look up, search up um, a more modernized version of the Apostles' Creed. Here's the traditional version. So don't let the language, you know, get, get, you know, stick, uh, stick, get, get you, uh, don't get stuck on the language. That's what I'm trying to say. The Apostles' Creed, the traditional version. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection the the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, friends, there's so much we could unpack here. There's so much we could dig into here, right? But the idea was this, that, that, that they began to share this good news, and it could be distilled down to these simple ideas, these simple beliefs. But it wasn't just what they said. It was that the way they backed up what they said by the way they lived. You see Peter writing to this early church saying, hold on to that hope. It's not just what we say or believe about God. It's how we live it out, right? So, so hold on to it. Be prepared to give an answer. And, and friends, part of that answer is how we live our faith out loud. I wonder as you reflect on these words of the Apostles' Creed as, as you've heard them, and if you need to skip back and listen to it again, or again, look, that, look it up online, you could easily do that. I wonder if as we reflect on these words Do do they capture what you believe? I want to return to the question that I asked as we began. I mean, whether you affirm the creed or not, can people tell your beliefs by how you live? I say my favorite color is orange. And now, look at me. I'm wearing an orange shirt. I got the orange watch band. I got the orange bracelet. I'm wearing orange shoes right? Almost any given day, you'll see me carrying around an orange cup or, or, I mean, I've got the watch on you. There's something about me. When I say that orange is my favorite color, you can go, oh, yeah, I see that. The same thing needs to be true. When we say that we love Jesus, people should be able to say, oh, yeah, I, I can see that. I, I can recognize that. When we say that we believe in God or the Holy Spirit, when we believe in this love, this new life that's been offered to us, when we say we believe those things, the world should be able to look at us and go, yes, I see it. That's, that's what I'm after today. That's what I'm asking about. If you say, I believe in a creative, all-powerful God and a resurrected living Jesus and the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live a new life, I want to say, how can I see that in your life? What difference do those beliefs practically make? When you come to the threshold of a private belief in Jesus and a lived out loud resurrected life, can the world see that you've crossed that boundary? Can the world see that you've stepped over into living it out loud? If you believe God's the creator, how is it demonstrated? 
Do you, do you care for creation? Do you help take care of the planet? Are, are you thinking about the ways in which we shepherd this creation? If Jesus is the resurrected son of God, how does the world see that belief? Do you demonstrate the love that you've received from Jesus, the new life made possible through Jesus by sharing it with others? Do you love your neighbors? Do you care for those in your family, in your community? If you believe in the Holy Spirit as a guide or a counselor, a helper, how does your life reflect that belief? Do you pray over big decisions? Do you, do you spend time considering and, and asking for wisdom before you, before you do anything big in your life? Do you have an answer ready for these questions? Do you have an answer ready for anyone who would ask you about why you believe what you believe and why you do the things you do? Is that answer consistent with how you live? I'm asking this of all of us, right? I, 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 add, I need to ask these questions of my own life. What am I sharing? What is my faith? What, is, what are you sharing? What is your faith? What do, you, what do we believe? How can anyone tell? So here's what I want us to do. I think, I think first thing we need to do is we need to wrestle with getting firm on what do we believe. Let's start with the Apostles' Creed. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great statement of faith. It's, it's been with us a long time because I think it does give us a good framework for the, these major beliefs, tenets of the faith, if you will, these pillars that we all cling to. I'd like to suggest we take these words of the Apostles' Creed and we rewrite them in our own words. Or maybe you paint them, or maybe you'll create a poem, or maybe it's you write a song. It's some way that you take the words of the creed and you, and you internalize them and, and share them in a way that makes sense to you. Make them personal, make them your own. That's what I'm saying. Rewrite them in a way that makes sense to you. And then what I want you to do is to practice sharing those words. Practice what I would call an elevator speech. What could you say to somebody in the in the distance it takes to go between a couple floors on an elevator, if they said, why do you believe in Jesus? You would have this statement, right? You would have this explanation. You would have this answer. Peter says, be ready with an answer. So let's get ready. Let's think about what we believe, and then let's practice sharing verbally what that belief would be. And then, friends, the hardest part of all comes. Practicing what we say we believe, right? Practicing what we preach. You might not say, well, I'm not, I don't preach. You get what I'm saying, right? It's the, it's the things we say. Do we live them out in real and practical ways? Does our life match up with what we say we believe? Friends, don't get, don't get worried about that. Don't get frightened about that. Peter says, right? Don't, don't be worried about what other people think. Yes, we might have a little grief for a time. But remember, we're not alone in this. Jesus told those disciples before he sent them out, remember, I'm going to be with you always, even until the end of the age. And, and Jesus is going to be with us even until the end of the age. Jesus helps us with this stuff. And friends, we're going to help each other with this stuff. We're in this together. So we can practice on one another. We can practice with one another. And when things get hard, when things get difficult, that's why we're the church so we can support each other and encourage each other and remind each other why we do what we do. When we get it wrong, we forgive one another and say, let's try that again. That's what it looks like. That's what it's about. Don't get worried or bogged down. We're in this together. So let's take our statements of belief. Let's help one another live them out in real and practical ways. Let's encourage one another to love as Jesus loves and to show it to a world who's, who will look at us with curiosity and doubt. They'll have questions as well they should because living the love of Jesus is different. It changes the world as it changes us. Friends, I don't know any better way to start that experience than with prayer. So will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, I pray that you give us the courage to, to do the things we say we want to do, to live out the beliefs we say we hold. That when we say we love Jesus, the world looks, us at, looks at us and says, yes, we can tell. Help us, God, in all the ways that you can, not only to, to proclaim your name, but to live your love. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen.